ancient words. What a blessing to be reminded of the importance of God's Word. There is indelibly etched in my mind an incident that took place in 1996. But let me take you back a year prior to that in 1995 when I had an opportunity to be in Cameroon for the very first time. And I met a young man, 18 years old, his name was Sam Goon. And Sam had planted two Grace Brother churches way up in the mountains in the northwest of Cameroon. And as I was talking to him, impressed with how this young man had accomplished this, I said, well, Sam, you know, uh, what kind of books do you have in your library? And he took out a ragtag copy of the King James Bible and said, this is all I have. And he said, oh, Pastor Keith, he said, I heard they made a new version of the King James. If you ever come back, will you bring it to me? And I said, yes, I will. And a year later, in 1996, I had the opportunity to go back to Cameroon. And there, as we flew in by helicopter, we landed at a soccer field up in the Oku area of Cameroon in the northwest. And now think about this. This is a year later. Who do you think was standing in the soccer field waiting for me? Pastor Sam Goom. And you know what I had in my hand? I had two books. I doubled his library. I had a copy of the New King James Bible. And back then you could still get a copy of the a concordance for the New King James Bible. And I had those two books. And he met me at the helicopter. And as I got out of the helicopter and moved toward him, he came running. He fell down on his knees in front of me. Took those two books out of my hand and with tears prayed and thanked God for his Bible that he had been waiting for. Now there's a serious person who understood the value of the Word of God. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the tireder I get. How many would say that's uh, all right? Those of you who have gray hair, I can see your hands. I was watching a football game the other night, which aren't as much fun to watch as they used to be because of all the controversy. But I saw a commercial on there that I thought to myself, boy, I have seen this over and over again. It was the Energizer Bunny. How many have seen the Energizer Bunny? He is a marketing icon. He's the mascot of Energizer Batteries in North America. It's a little pink toy rabbit wearing sunglasses and blue and white striped sandals, and he's beating that bass drum that has the Energizer logo on it. Do you know that that little bunny has been appearing on commercials since 1989? Can you imagine that? 1989, 28 years. And of course, the purpose of it is to encourage people to believe that Energizer batteries will run indefinitely. Now we all know they don't, right? (laughs) But um, he has appeared in more than 115 television commercials. He appeared with such people as Darth Vader. Remember that? Uh, When Darth Vader was standing there and all of a sudden the Energizer bunny comes by and he goes, there's a disturbance in the force. And uh, he goes on to fight, remember, and Darth Vader's fighting with his lightsaber and the bunny's fighting with his lightsaber and all of a sudden Darth Vader's lightsaber drained out and he opens up the thing and unscrews it and he has the super volt battery. You know, it ran out, but the Energizer battery didn't. And that little uh, bunny has met up with the Wicked Witch of the West, King Kong, Wile E. Coyote, and Boris and Natasha. And every one of them would try to destroy or capture the bunny only to see complications arise when their batteries went out first. I really like the one where he met up with the Wicked Witch of the West. And it's very subtle because all of a sudden the sprinkler system comes on and melts her. Do you remember that commercial? And of course, you don't really see it, but in the background up in the ceiling is a smoke detector. And I think it had Energizer on it. You know, it had an Energizer battery. And of course, all of these commercials were um, trying to teach us that, you know, these batteries will go on and on and on in spite of all the difficulties, all the obstacles, all the enemies that the bunny would face. And I was so impressed, I decided to Google it last week, and I got on the Energizer battery website. I'd encourage you to do this. And you know how when you go in there and you go shopping around? Well, here's what it says on the logo on their website. Enjoy hopping around our website. 
All right, so some of you are awake. Here's the point of the commercial. It is the ability to keep on going and going in spite of all the circumstances that would normally drain your battery. And there is a parallel to the Christian life because some of us feel that way, that our batteries are becoming drained. Do you ever feel that way? That your batteries are wearing out in serving the Lord? And the question is, how do we keep on going and going? Well, there is a man in the Bible whose life gives us an example of how to keep on going and going in the ministry, and that's the Apostle Paul. And I'd like for you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, if you're not already there, chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because it's in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians that we find the secret of how he was able to keep on going and going for the Lord in spite of all the trials, all the difficulties, all the disturbances that he faced, all of the uh, punishment that he underwent. He was able to keep on going and going for the Lord. In this second letter, Paul is in Macedonia and he's getting ready to make his third visit to Corinth. And he's writing about the ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ gave him. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians does a number of things, but the glory of the ministry of serving Jesus Christ is laid out in full in this letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church. And he described when he begins the message that he was commissioned to proclaim, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had left heaven become a man by the incarnation, had died on the cross as our substitute to pay for our sins, shedding His blood there. He was buried and rose again from the dead. And that all who will put their faith and trust in Him can have eternal life. That was Paul's message that Christ gave him. He spoke of the glory of the ministry, but also of the hardships and the trials and the difficulties that made it hard to be faithful to following Jesus Christ. And he made it clear here in this letter that he could only keep going if he concentrated, concentrated on spiritual goals. His eye of faith was on eternal issues, beloved, not on temporal ones. And so what was it that kept Paul going in spite of minimal earthly rewards, great danger in his life, possible death almost constantly? Well, I believe there were at least six things that motivated Paul to persevere in his service for the Lord. Now we're going to cover five of them very quickly. I'm not going to preach for three and a half hours or seven hours, just an hour and a half. Oh, no. But there are six motivations that should help us to persevere in our service for the Lord and to prepare us to meet Him face to face after the rapture of the church. You know that's going to happen, right? We are going to meet Him face to face, each of us individually, and each of us are going to give an account. And so we need to be busy for the Lord here on earth because, beloved, it really does matter what you do or don't do on this earth. Would you pray with me before we look at the text this morning? Father, we ask again that the Spirit of God would help us to understand Your Word. That as we look at the life of Your precious Apostle Paul, that we would learn from him. We remember he said, follow me as I follow Christ. May we do that together. May we learn from Your Word. May we leave this place this morning changed. May we leave this place determined, like Paul, to keep on going and going for Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask these things in His name and for His sake. Amen. Well, take a look at with me at Paul's very first motivation. His first motivation was glory. And we're going to start in verse 14 of chapter 4. Actually, let's start in verse 13. Paul says, But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore also we speak. Knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Now he's talking about the rapture. Remember what's going to happen? The, those living saints will be uh, raptured, they'll be transformed, but the dead saints in Christ, church age saints, will be raised from the dead. Paul thought he would be in that group. For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. It's by grace that we're saved. It's by grace that we're going to be with the Lord. 
Paul says, therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul's first motivation was glory. Glory to God, first of all, by the giving of thanks of those who have received the grace of God, that's us, through responding to the salvation message of Jesus Christ, as the gospel is preached and people are saved, God gets all the glory. Amen? He's the one who saves us. He's done all the work through His Son. And it's because of the grace of God. Remember, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All of our boasts should be in God and in His glory. And not only glory to God was what motivated Paul, but glory for himself. God is the one who is, who is at work in us to bring about our glorification. Just as certainly as He saved us, He's going to glorify us. Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 8. Glorification is as certain a fact as He raised His Son from the dead. The rapture, the resurrection, and reunion is ahead for us. You know, glory is a powerful motivator. Glory is what motivates athletes to stand at the top of one of those three platforms at the Olympics and to have that medal hung around your neck with the whole world watching. That's a great motivation. Or even something very insignificant can be a great motivator. Parents, as you tell your children, well done. Or as you look at things that they have accomplished and, and tell them that they have uh, really done a good job, they find that that glory motivates them. It may be as little as taking out the trash or cleaning their room, but glory is a great motivator. Glory for God and glory for Himself was a powerful motivation for Paul. And it ought to motivate us too, that one day we're going to be in glory. Paul's second motivation was his faith. Look at what he said again in verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul's second motivation was his faith. You know, there are 51 different forms of the word to look in the New Testament in Greek. This is a word that means to regard very closely, to watch something, to notice the details carefully. It, it predominantly has the idea of a mental process that means you're paying close attention in order to be prepared to respond to something appropriately. So like if you're in school and your teacher is teaching and you're going to have a test, you're going to pay close attention to those things so that you're ready for the test that you're going to take. Actually, this word is the word from which we get our English word overseer from. This is a word that's used of pastors who look over, carefully scrutinizing the sheep, watching over them to care for them. And faith is the essence of how Paul could see the glory of Christian ministry rather than to be disillusioned by the obstacles. How many have ever been there? The obstacles have disillusioned you in your Christian life. And you're looking at those things the trials and the difficulties rather than Christ, and looking with the eyes of faith. Paul said that the Corinthian believers had learned to do two things, and they're very difficult things. Two things absolutely vital but extremely difficult in the Christian life. Look at the first one. Not to look at the things which are seen. Look, all you have to do is get a newspaper and open it up and look at all the advertising or those um, uh, brochures that you get in all of the papers, or you turn on your television and there's all that advertising, and boy, you didn't know you needed something until you saw it on television. Then you said, oh wow, I really need that. Boy, to not look at the things that are seen, just sit and watch television for three minutes and find out how many things that are now something that you think you might need. The second thing they had learned to do was to focus their gaze on things not seen. Do you see that in verse 18? but at the things which are not seen. Now that's an oxymoron. Now that's not a stupid cow. All right? An oxymoron are two things that on the surface seem to be contradictory. But as you study them more deeply, they, they really make sense. Here's one. Military intelligence. Here's another one. 
How about this one? You'll, you'll be able to pick up on this. Political promises, right? Those are oxymorons. How can you look at things not seen? Only by faith. And Paul was able by faith. He and others had learned. Look, notice what he says. We look. We. We had learned a basic truth that the most serious and difficult of human problems of this present world are only temporary and transitory. I was driving down the road, I don't, don't remember where, around Fremont, Ohio, where I live, and I saw this guy, he had this giant truck. I mean, it was jacked up and had the giant tires and had chrome all over it and the lights and the roll bar and everything. And I don't know what the thing cost, probably fifty or $60,000. And right on his back bumper, uh, the big chrome bumper that he had, it had a bumper sticker, and this is what it said, He who has the most toys wins. Now that certainly is looking at the things of this life and not of the things of the next life. It's the unseen things of spiritual value. It is knowing your sins are forgiven. Knowing that you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Knowing that you're living a regenerated life. Knowing that you can understand and communicate with the living God, that you can talk to Him. I love that story of Spurgeon. A man came and said, how do you know Jesus is really alive? And Spurgeon said, well, I just talked to Him this morning. And that ought to be how it ought to be for all of us as we live the Christian life. It's a reality, our faith. Glory is a powerful motivator. Being able to see with the eyes of faith is a powerful motivator. But Paul's third motivation was hope. Look at verses 1 through 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house, now you know what he's talking about, our bodies, right? In this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, shall not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Man, Paul had hope. Paul's ministry was characterized by trials physical beatings, weaknesses. He worked so hard for the Lord because of his love for the Lord. He loved the believers that he had led to Christ. He, he prayed for them. His body was wearing out. He knew that death was inevitable, but death was not a fear to him. He knew there was another life coming. When Paul talks about the earthly tent, which is our house, he is referring to our physical body. And he's talking about the destruction of this physical body. Gabe, I don't know why you prayed for me this morning. Where is he? Gabe, I don't know why you prayed for me about my health, but we were playing kickball with my grand... There were nine of the grandchildren out playing against the adults, and most of us were in our 60s. And I went to kick the ball, and I missed. They laughed so hard. You know how you missed the whole ball? And I pulled my hamstring. And, and uh, this was the second time I played kickball, and the second time I pulled my hamstring. And one of the, the little kids said to me yesterday... Do you think that maybe God is telling you you shouldn't be playing kickball anymore, Uncle Keith? Maybe. Hope. Hope that these bodies are going to be changed. We groan in these present physical bodies. And as you get older, you groan more, right? It's true. And the point of all that Paul is saying is that eternal things, when compared to earthly things, we should be concentrating on the eternal things. That should be our hope and another motivation for serving the Lord. And what so encouraged this hope in Paul? It was God Himself who had prepared believers for the prospect of glory. We're going to heaven. We are going to be there. Maybe today. Maybe today. Maybe yet this morning. What a hope we have of eternal life. Immortality. A new body. And glory. Glory. Faith. Hope. And Paul's fourth motivation was courage. Look at verses 6-8. through eight. Therefore, always being of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Notice twice in these per verses, Paul speaks of courage. The therefore clearly connects this verse with the last one. Since we hope, because we have the Holy Spirit and complete assurance of our future life, and we have the 
courage to continue to serve the Lord in spite of trials and difficulties. How many have ever wanted to just give up? Be honest. Man, I have. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that pastors want to give up. Paul, I don't know how many times you and I called each other over the past 40 years and talked about the difficulties of the ministry and all the trials. And Can you imagine that? 40 years ago, Pastor Paul led me to Christ. 40 years ago. And we're still here. Not because there's anything in us, brother. Only because Jesus has held us close to Himself all these years. Praise God for that. But it gives us courage in spite of trials and difficulties and physical infirmities, mental anguish. We are always of good courage. Verse 7 really isn't an additional thought or an aside when Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. He is thinking of the blessed realities of the life to come that give him courage. I have a couple of little grandsons. Both Two of them are here. I have a number of grandsons, but my two little guys, Josh and Sam, I remember um, on Father's Day, Melinda and Jamie uh, planned a day at the beach at White Star Park. It's a uh, renovated gravel quarry. And I had been watching the big kids diving off the diving board all day long, and all of a sudden I saw Sammy. Now, Joshy, I saw you do it too, but it was Sammy that I remember that day. And uh, he didn't have his life jacket on. He was just this little tiny guy. And here's all these teenagers jumping off this diving board into this gravel pit. And I'm like ready to get ready to jump out of my chair and go get him. Of course, Melinda, you were down in the water, I saw. But he just ran right off and jumped right in the, in the water. And I thought, what courage that takes to do that. We need some people like that in the Christian life. To have the courage to go out and tell people about Jesus regardless of what they're going to faith, face. Glory, faith, hope. Courage, all motivated Paul. His fifth motivation was ambition. Listen to this in verse 9. Therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to the Lord. It's a really interesting word, the word therefore here. It's different than the other therefores in this chapter. You can't tell it in your English Bible. But if you read the Greek text, it's very clear. It's kind of like he's saying, So, in light of all these things, we have as our ambition, our goal... To please the Lord. In fact, the word ambition here is the word that means to love honor. To devote oneself zealously to a cause. To act out of love for honor. An honor that belongs to the Lord. We make it our aim. It is our ambition. It is our goal. We love it as a point of honor. To do what? What brings us honor? We know what brings honor to the world. You know, To be number one. To accomplish some great goal. But Paul says, here's his ambition, to be pleasing to Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast with the ambition of the world. Blind ambition causes people to compromise their convictions, violate their beliefs, sacrifice their character. It's sad that ambition today in our vocabulary is often associated with words like unscrupulous or self-centered or proud or driven or insensitive or ruthless. And those negative modifiers reflect the carnage inflicted that people have done to their family and friends and the principles abandoned in order to uh, have all that the world offers. Ambition drives people to seek wealth and prestige and power and social prominence and popular, popular acclaim, dominate over others. You know where ambition actually came from? It's a Latin term. It was used by politicians. It meant to go around, ambitio, to go around and get votes. Isn't that amazing? All these years later, it still means that. The word was used by the Romans to refer to politicians who went around canvassing for votes to get themselves elected at any cost. It was used to describe those with no convictions who sought promotion at any cost to do anything to achieve their selfish ends. Thus, it really had the idea in the beginning to describe someone as ambitious in a negative way. But Paul uses it in a positive way. The ambition of the world is centered on self. The ambition of Christians is centered on the Savior. That's the difference. That's who we live for. Not for self, but for Him. Whether we are physically alive or physically dead. No matter what state we find ourselves in. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. Paul certainly wanted to be well-pleasing to God. Glory, faith, hope, courage, ambition. 
But I want to tell you the last one is the one that really convicts my heart. It's one that I don't think many Christians ever think about or ever even really dwell upon or meditate on. And that was Paul's sixth and final motivation to continue to serve the Lord was judgment. Look at what it says in verse 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I kind of wish that last word wasn't there in the end of verse 10. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. What's the first word of verse 10? Four. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Here is an explanation of why Paul wanted to have as his ambition to please the Lord. It was the Bema seat judgment of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, our greatest motivation ought to be love. That was mentioned by Pastor Aaron this morning. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. He took our sin upon Himself. He was buried in that tomb for three days. And He rose from the dead, now sits at the right hand of our Heavenly Father as our great high priest and our mediator. Paul understood all that. He loved the Lord. And that alone really ought to be sufficient incentive to faithfully follow Him. You know, I have never gotten over being saved. Have you? I still get up every morning, 40 years later, and say, Good morning, Lord, it's Keith. Thank you for saving me. You know that the name, the one word that every person loves to hear is their own name. And so just so he knows who it is talking to him, I always tell him, It's Keith, Lord. Thanks for saving me. Thanks for saving me, Lord. I've never gotten over being saved. That's why I want to tell people about Jesus all over the world. Because He saved me. Paul says that beyond even love, there's a day of reckoning coming, beloved. There is a day of reckoning coming. Let's just answer a few questions about the Bema seat of Christ. Who is going to be judged? Well, look at verse 10 carefully. It, are, it is Christians. Church, age, saints those who have been saved from beginning on the day of Pentecost up to the time of the rapture. This is talking about Christians, all right? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds. The ones, all of us, we each one. So collectively and yet individually, every one of us is going to stand and give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ of our life. Paul stresses the extent and the importance of the Bema over and over again. Beloved, there is a coming accountability for how we've lived our life for Jesus Christ. You can't just do anything that you want to do and think that you won't have to stand and give an account to Jesus. It really does matter, beloved, what you do or don't do here in this life on this earth. It really does. Paul said this to the Romans. This is an interesting context. You know how uh, it's always easier to see the log that's in your brother's eye than the one that's in your own eye. You can see the splinter in your brother's eye. And how we love to judge each other in order to sometimes build ourselves up. Don't be saying you've never done it. Because I've done it. Listen to what Paul says in talking about that kind of judging. He says this, But you, talking to believers, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Now he's not talking about judging sin. He's talking about judging those who are weak. The weaker judges the stronger brother. The stronger brother judges the weaker brother. You don't think he ought to do this. The stronger brother says, well, I don't really care what the weaker brother thinks. And Paul says, stop judging each other. Because guess what? There is a judgment coming and it's going to be from Jesus and it will be for all of us. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul wrote to the Colossians, very interesting, another interesting context. He's talking to slaves and he says this, For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. That's talking about Christian slaves. 
To the Ephesian believers, he says, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Paul wrote to Timothy and said this, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What day? The day of the Bema. Do you know there are just all kinds of references to the Bema seat of Christ in the, in the epistles? Most people don't see them, but they're there. Dozens and dozens. The day, that day. James said this, remember? So speak. And so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Who's the judge and when's that going to take place? Well, listen to this. Pastors, Pastor Aaron, Pastor Paul, Pastor Keith, listen to this. Pastor Tom, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Where's that going to take place? Where will we have to stand and give an account of every word we've spoken, every verse that we have exposited to the saints? We have to give an account. It's serious business to stand in the pulpit and say, thus says God. We will give an account. See, it really does matter, beloved, what you do or don't do on this earth. It really does. All Christians who are living at the time of the rapture and all those Christians who have died before the rapture will stand at the Bema seat judgment of God. How will we be judged? We'll look at the verse again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The anointed one. The one whom God chose to be the Savior of the world. We must all appear. I believe the NIV, if you have it, the New American Standard, the King James, the New King James, and even the ESV all translate this as appear. And you know, it's sad because that's not really what the Word or its teaching. That is a, it's a, it's an in the active voice. That means that the subject is performing the action, but you know what? In the Greek text, it's a passive. You know what that means? That the subject is being acted upon by someone else. You know what the word really means? See, you get the idea we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's true. We will appear. And it, but it makes the idea like each one of us walks up and stands before Jesus. But this word means that we're going to be disclosed by Christ. He is the one who is going to cause us to be opened up and everything is going to be laid bare before the one to whom we have to do. Someone else is acting upon us and it's Jesus Christ. To be made manifest means not just to appear, but to be laid bare. To be stripped of every outward facade and openly revealed in the full and true reality of one's character. And I would add, by the judge himself who has eyes like flames of fire. He knows every one of us, every thought, every word we've ever spoken, every single thing. The late Adrian Rogers, how many have ever heard him? I like to listen to those Scottish preachers. And Here's what he said on this verse. The day of judgment will be a day when all of the skeletons will come out of the closets. In that day, the full truth about our lives and character and deeds will be made clear to each one of us. Each will discover the real verdict of his or her ministry, our service and our motives for Christ. All hypocrisy, all pretense will be stripped away. All temporal matters with no eternal significance will vanish like wood, hay, and stubble. And only what is to be rewarded as eternally valuable will be left. Remember what Samuel wrote? God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Paul, or the author of Hebrews, wrote this, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It really will matter one day what we have done or haven't done here on this earth. And where will we, we, where will we be judged? Well, I think it's going to be in heaven. I think the Bema seat of Christ will be in heaven. It says in verse 10, before the judgment seat of Christ, it's the Bema it's an interesting Greek word. It originally meant just to take a step. That's what it meant, the verb. Then it had the idea of taking a step up, and that meant a raised platform. And so the bema became considered a step. And then eventually the Romans would put on pillars um, or, or stones a stone-like tabletop, and they called it the bema. How many have ever been to Corinth? Anybody here ever been to Corinth? I had an opportunity many years ago to go to the city of Corinth and Thessalonica. 
Uh, I was on my way to Israel to study in Israel uh, for a semester, uh, a winter semester, and we stopped over in Corinth, and guess what? They have actually excavated the Bema that Paul is talking about here in the city of Corinth. You can go see it with your own eyes. I have pictures of it. It's very impressive. It's a big stone slab set on pillars, and it was the Roman place of judgment. It was very thought-provoking as I stood there looking at it. Paul's not speaking of a general judgment of all men, but of the judgment of Christians. He's not describing penal punishment for our sins. That was taken by Christ on the cross. This is an examination of a believer's works in his life and why he did them. And that will determine whether he receives a reward or not, or the loss of reward. The Lord is going to examine every single one of us, how each one of us in our physical bodies have given our service for Him. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to turn there with me, would you? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Here the Apostle Paul is really talking about pastors. Many people read this passage and they immediately make the first application to everybody in the church. Now there is an application to everybody. I do believe that's true. But in this context, Paul is talking about he planted the church at, at Corinth. Paul, um, Apollos came along and watered, and there were other men now there in the ministry helping that church to grow. And this is what Paul says to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Notice, each man. Individual accountability. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it. Notice the day. The Bema. Because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. We're going to be judged in heaven. And why will we be judged? Look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Why will we be judged? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice that word must. It is a logical necessity. That every one of us who have served the Lord would be examined by Him. It's an inevitable truth. You know, it's not like with your parents, kids, where you can get away with doing things and they don't find out and you're glad. Well, let me tell you something. There's nothing any of us have ever done that Jesus doesn't know about. It's a necessity that we be judged. And what is the purpose? Well, Look at this carefully in verse 10. That each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. His purpose is to evaluate us on how we lived our life for him in this body. And what will be judged? It's our works. Our works will be judged. Our life of service for the Lord. Not for our sin. It's not talking about here for the penalty of sin. Believers are not going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for a penal uh, punishment for sin. Every believer was judged at the cross. Paul makes that clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this very letter, later on he says this in verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. Paul wrote, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. And listen to what Paul says, who intercedes for us. But we must be judged for our works according to what He has done with reference to what we've done in the body. And Christ's judgment will be impartial. That assures us that each individual will receive as his own the things done in the body. And I remember what I said? Look at the last part of verse 10. Whether good or bad. You know, I think that most believers think that the judgment seat of Christ is just an awards ceremony. I don't believe that. I believe it is an awards ceremony, but I don't believe that's all it is. 
I believe there's something else here. Whether good or bad. You remember we read about the fire that's going to test the gold, silver, and precious stones in the wood, hay, and stubble? What are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones? You know, Paul doesn't tell us exactly what they are. He says they're going to be tested by fire, but I think we can figure those things out. Those things that are being done for Christ with the right motives. Going to work for the glory of God like Daniel did. Ladies cleaning the house, not as a drudgery, but because you love God. Teaching your children the truth of the Word of God because you love God. Submitting to your husbands because that's what Jesus Christ wants, not because you have to and because it just makes things easier at home. Jesus knows all those things. If you're teaching a Sunday school class, if you're taking care of the babies in the nursery, if you come here and clean this building, if you work as a secretary, maybe you're out cutting the grass or working in the parking lot, whatever you do for the Lord, He says, I will reward you if it's done with the right motives. As you put in the offering plate this morning, let me ask you, does Jesus know how much you gave? Does He know how much you gave when you put it in the offering plate this morning? He sure does. How would we know that? Well, remember he sat in front of the temple one day and he watched all those rich people putting in all their bags of money. And then this poor woman comes along and she puts in what would be equivalent, they say today, to one cent, one penny of our money. And what did Jesus say about her? She has given more than all of them together. He knows the sacrifice you're willing to make. See, it's not the amount that you put in, it's the sacrifice that demonstrates the amount that you give in. That's what Jesus is going to do. And remember what He said? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Wow. Please, Jesus, could we just pass over that and go to the... Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What did He mean by that? Do you mean that there are actually treasures in heaven that we're going to receive if we have done things for the Lord that are good? Treasures? And when we think about treasures here, you know, gold and precious stones and jewels and all those things... If Jesus is going to give it to us, what kind of treasures do you think we're going to have in eternity? We can't even imagine them. I think that's why Paul doesn't even outline them. We can't even imagine the treasures that we're going to have in heaven. But then there's also, beloved, the bad. Now, that's an interesting word. It's not one of the normal words, Greek words in the New Testament for bad. There are two words often used. This is a, a very different word. It really means worthless. It doesn't mean bad in an evil way. It just means it was good for nothing. That's what I would translate it today. Those things that were good for nothing. The wood, the hay, and the stubble. Um, pastoring a church so that your name is up on the marquee. Doesn't that always get you, you know, this man's ministry? It's not our glory. It's the glory of Jesus Christ that we're interested in. Why do you go to, church? Why do you go to work, guys? See, if you go to work just to make money, there's nothing wrong with that. Provide for your family. But you know what? If you're just going to work, just to go to work, and it's a drudgery, there's not going to be any reward for that. But I guarantee you, if you go to work and you say, Lord, I'm going to do my very best to show others what a Christian works and looks like, I'm going to go there and have, Lord, give me an opportunity this morning to share my faith, or today to share my faith with someone, there's where the rewards are going to come. That's when God is going to say, well done, good and faithful ser a servant. You see, just going to work to make money, to have a new car, to have a bigger house, to move up the corporate ladder, there's no eternal value in those things. But if you're doing those things for the glory of the Lord, ah, then there's going to be a reward. Good or bad. Notice what it says here, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. What if it is worthless? I believe there's going to be a suffering of loss. That's what the text says. He will suffer loss in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That fire will test the work. And I believe that means you're going to forfeit a reward. What did the Apostle John mean when he wrote these words, beloved? Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears... Now who's he talking to, little children? Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears... He's talking to Christians so that when He appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. What did He mean by that? He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to the unsaved. 
You mean you can live a life that would, when you, if Jesus would appear, you would be ashamed to stand before Him? Absolutely. And I guarantee if you're living that kind of life, you need to repent right now and say, Lord Jesus, these things are wrong. I don't want to, I don't want to shrink away from you in shame. Paul's not talking about, John's not talking about losing your salvation. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your life. Of, you look back at your life and you say, wow, I, I was living for self and not for Christ. What did John mean when he said this? Watch yourselves. That you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. What does John mean? He's not talking about losing your salvation. He's talking about losing your reward. That there's something about living your life. It really does matter, beloved, what you do or don't do here on this earth. It really does matter. The rewards will be glory. Our inheritance. I believe it's going to be who gets to reign in certain aspects in the kingdom. I think we're going to have varying degrees of, of positions uh, in the kingdom of God serving along with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, uh, Mommy Zebedee came along to Jesus one day and she said, Hey, Lord, I've got a couple things I want to ask for my boys. This is Pastor Keith's paraphrase. All right? I want to ask a couple things. Remember this? I got a, hey, hey my, bu- my boys over here, James and John. And he goes, Okay, ask. And she goes, Well, could they just sit at your right hand and your left? You remember what Jesus said? That's not mine to give. That's determined by my Father in heaven. You mean there really are places somebody is going to be at his right hand? And somebody is going to be on the left hand, believers? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are going to be varying degrees of serving the Lord Jesus Christ throughout eternity. Don't ask, I can't explain it all. I just know that's, I I understand that's what Paul is trying to explain here. Now, when will we be judged? I believe after the tribulation. I mean, after the rapture, during the tribulation. Some say it's at death, and they have some reasons why they believe that. But listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Again, in another passage about judging each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart, And then each man's praise will come to him from God. The Corinthians had been passing judgment on Paul's ministry. And he says, listen, there's a a day coming, a time coming. When is that? That's the Bema. The time here is very emphatic in the Greek text. It's not the normal chronological time. It, It has the idea of the appropriateness of the time. He will expose the truth about every one of us. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Paul understood this judgment. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. What day is he talking about to Timothy? What day? The Bema. The Bema of Christ. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Will it make a difference in the sweet by and by, what we do in the here and now? Yes, it absolutely will. Now, uh, how many here, I know we have a lawyer here, how many here have appeared in a courtroom before? Raise your hand. I want to see, put your hand up. Hi. You've been in, don't be afraid. Now, I don't think because somebody raises your hand, you were there because you were bad. Maybe you were called for jury duty or whatever. Okay. I saw some of you kind of hesitate, and I thought, oh, I bet you there people will think, oh, I did something bad, and that's why I was in court. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I have never been in a courtroom and not been uneasy. There's something about sitting in a courtroom with the judge, even if you're not the one on trial. There's a seriousness about it as the judge enters and takes his seat. You know what, beloved? There are many things relating to this great matter of the judgment seat of Christ that we ought to be thinking about and take utmost care and diligence in living our life for Christ because of the certainty of this judgment that's coming. And each of us individually is going to give an account. And we will be recompensed for the things done in the body, our service for Christ. Each one of us, whether good or bad. I thought about, you know, um, I wish I could bring a big, uh, like a 
Mercedes Benz or a Rolls Royce up here and say, this is for you. And call your name. And when you get up here, I say, oh, sorry. You don't really get it because this is how you lived your life. Is that way it's going to be? Is that what Jesus is going to do? He's going to have all of our rewards and then we'll see the ones that we receive because we've done those things with the right motive and for His glory and honor. And then the other things are just going to be all burned up. They're going to be gone. I don't know all of the details. But here's what I do know. Look at verse 11. Paul says the seriousness of this judgment caused him to go out and preach the gospel to persuade men to be reconciled to Christ. Think about this now. Here's the connection. He's a believer. He knows his salvation is secure. He's not worried about... Uh, it's not the terror of the Lord like it is in the King James. The word terror there, it, it has the idea here of reverence or awe. And Paul is saying in, in, in light of the reverence and awe that he understood the Bema would be for believers... He says this, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We know that the fear of the Lord here is not some terror that somehow we're going to lose our salvation. In fact, Dr. Luke says this in Acts chapter 9, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. And so the fear of the Lord there for believers is not terror that He's going to cast us into hell. We, Jesus already took our punishment. But it's a reverence. It's an, it's an awe of standing before Christ Himself and giving an account of your entire Christian life to Him. The motivations for ministry are great. Glory and faith and hope and courage and ambition. But this judgment is the one that really caused my heart to stop and think. Now listen to this. This is Paul, this is Peter writing. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? You see why Paul. Um, wanted to persuade men. Now listen to what he says. Think about this. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful Creator in doing what is right. Difficult for the You mean it's difficult for God to save us? Yes. Think how sinful you are. Think how many people you know who you want to know Christ, but they have no desire to know Him. And Paul says, if it's difficult that the righteous are saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, listen to this warning that the Scriptures give. Repent of your sins right now. Trust Christ as your Savior this morning, today. Because if believers are going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ, just think about what it's going to be like for an unbeliever. And we know if we read Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. Jesus is going to reward you, beloved, for your faithful service. You can be sure of that. So work hard. Jesus is going to re recompense us for unfaithful service. We ought to change our direction. And Jesus is going to return soon, and we need to be ready, don't we? It really does make a difference what we do or don't do in this life. Father, we thank You for Your love and grace and mercy. We thank You, Heavenly Father, that none of us is going to ever stand before Jesus and, and those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior and be worried about our salvation. But Father, help us to be concerned about how we've lived our life for Jesus. Let us give all that we have, all that we are, Help us, Father, to do what is so clearly stated in the Scriptures, that we should love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And Father, how we're looking forward to that day 
when Jesus is going to come to take us home. And Father, to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. We pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen.